of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to read verse 13 and get right into the lesson tonight. Just reading verse 13 for now. Paul uh, writes, I, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. So tonight the lesson is simply titled, titled, Them Which Are Asleep. Now there's many times, and we've gone through many different lessons on, on the, the ignorance and how Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant about this or about that. Uh, this is another one that's a big one that, um, that Paul is addressing. His desire was that we would not be ignorant, that we would never presume for a moment that the, you know, uh, that we here at Temple Baptist Church would ever be ignorant in areas. But you know what? As, as children grow up, they, they must be biblically taught just like us. They, they need to be taught. We need to be taught. We need to be reminded. Sometimes you'll hear something, and you may not hear it again for years. And then all of a sudden, it comes up again as a reminder, as a remembrance to help us remember those things so that we're not ignorant of those things. So our taking certain biblical doctrines for granted could lead to those subjects no longer being preached or taught uh, and, 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 and us raising a new generation that's ignorant of Bible doctrine. Right now, we really, I believe we have two generations that are biblically ignorant, and it's getting worse. It's getting worse because people don't want to go to church. They don't want to hear the word of God. They don't want to, they don't want to entertain biblical doctrine. They want to, they want to use Google as their, as their information. They want to use Google. They want to use uh, different search engines to try to, to try to fact check uh, things. But they don't realize that those are all programmed by the world, and they're going to give you the world's responses. All right, it, they're not going to teach you biblical, you know, biblical truths. It, uh, scarcely can you even find churches anymore that are teaching biblically, doctrinally true things. They're just going off and, and, and they're getting all caught up in the other aspects and they're leaving off doctrine. They're leaving off those things. And they're all, what we do by doing that is we, we celebrate ignorance. Like that old saying, ignorance is bliss. Well, also it's a bad thing. Yeah, you know what? There are there are some things that we would be better off not knowing. Now, remember, if you go back to Adam and Eve, they didn't know good or evil. They had no knowledge at all of those things. They had knowledge of what they were in. They had knowledge of who God was. They had knowledge of what He put them there to do. They had knowledge that they were uh, that everything was un and subject unto them, and they lived their lives in peace and happiness. Uh, there was no need uh, even for for clothing because they had no knowledge that they were even naked. And it wasn't until they obtained knowledge that they sought after knowledge more than after God, and we find that that caused the sin. That's where it all comes after, was a lust for knowledge. Ooh, we can know something. It can make me wise. It can make me know good from evil. It looks good. That looks like something I'd want to eat. And all of a sudden, boom, she's eating it. Her eyes are opened. Then, in her excitement, her wonder, and her awe, she comes over and gives it to Adam, and his eyes are open. Then they try to hide themselves when God came to talk with them. Because now, we know we're naked. Now there's shame. There was never shame before knowledge. Now we're going to go back to that. Once we... Once we Get everything set and done. There's a new heaven. There's a new earth. 
There's going to be no more knowledge of sin. There's going to be no more knowledge of good or bad. It's just going to be knowledge of what is. What is. Who God is, just like it was in the beginning. We're going to know who God is. We're going to know who we are. We're going to know our place there. We're going to know our roles there. We're going to know what we're supposed to do. But outside of that, we're really not going to know about all that. You know what? We're not even going to remember the devil. As big of a pain as he is, we won't be able, you know, I know we don't want to remember him. We don't want to. And that's going to be a great thing. But, I mean, how can you forget somebody that's that big of a pain? How can you forget somebody? Somebody that, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like trying to forget your school bully, right? But one day, it's gone. He will be gone from our mind. We will go back to without knowledge. So there, there was some happy times without knowledge, all right? But now that we're inside of knowledge, we're already inside of sin, we have to come to a place where we cannot be ignorant of these doctrines that, that God has in his, in his word that he expects us to live by because that's going to run us to be in trouble with God, all right? Now, Paul in verse 13, he deals with an event that's going to take, that, that we will all face uh, if the Lord is not returned in our lifetime. And I'm not going to use a lot of verses on death. It's a subject where, where we all know very, very well. Um, but in Genesis 2.17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So right there, right there in the name, the name of that tree was the tree of of knowledge of good and evil. It, it was spelled out right there. And he says, you of that tree, you will not partake because you're not supposed to know. There's things you're not supposed to know. Did you know that? We're not supposed to know certain things. <laughs> A Christian should not know certain things. And of course, like I said, we're going to go back to that. Uh, once we, once it's all said and done, Genesis three nineteen, the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat, uh, shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Romans five twelve, wherefore as by one, uh, one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So the question must be answered, does man only have temporal life or does man have life after death? Now, there's several different viewpoints I'm going to address uh, in this introduction. I, I just want to, there's only one right one, by the way, but we're going to give you some of the, we're going to give you a few of the ways that some people think, all right? And I'll, it shouldn't be hard to pick out which one's the right one because I'm going to tell you what it is anyway. First, there's a viewpoint of the atheist or agnostic that that man dies like a dog, uh, dies uh, never more to have conscience state. The body goes back to the dust. Their reasoning is everything that came into existence through Big Bang and evolution. Their perspective is that man is just another animal. It's just higher intelligence instead of uh, divine design. But... This is the fool of Psalm 14, 1, which says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Second, there's the viewpoint of the unsaved man that believes that there is a God, but chooses not to place his faith or his or her faith in him. This individual is not a fool, but is certainly foolish. Their perspective is that of no hope. They understand that they will never see their loved one again, and they mourn with great, incredible loss. Thirdly, there's the viewpoint of some 
who believe that if you are not one of their number, your body goes back to dust, your soul is alienated by God. Fourthly, there's a viewpoint of some that when man dies, their soul sleeps in the grave until such a time as God resurrects both it and the body. Then there is the biblical viewpoint, which is right, that when man dies, the body goes to the grave, the spirit go back to God who gave it. In Ecclesiastes 12, 7, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So there's a lot of misunderstanding concerning the subject of death. The words sleep and asleep found in the Bible are confusing to the casual reader, reader as the answer can only come through rightly dividing the word of truth. We read here that the lost have no hope. Sorrow not as those that have no hope. Somebody that has no hope is someone that has died lost. There is no more hope left for them. There are a few uh, segments of people that are alive and have no hope, and those are reprobates that have been turned over and given to their own devices because they will not come to the knowledge of the truth and get out of their wicked abominations. God gives them over to a reprobate mind, and they just go on, and, and that's the end of it. There's not, you're not going to rescue anybody like that because they will always put the abomination over God. And so we, we can see that uh, very clearly. Now, every person who's been on this earth has an eternal existence. God breathed eternal life into the body of Adam. That life that God gave to Adam came from God and it will never cease. He is ever living, so his breath is ever living. It is that, that's why his word is ever living, because it was breathed out of the mouth of God. It is eternal. It will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away before his word will. And that's already, that's already in the scripture that the first heaven and the first earth were passed away with a great noise and with the melting of the elements and fervent heat, because there were sin in those places, and there can be no remembrance of sin. So for us to be around, so for us to have no knowledge of sin, we have to dwell where sin never existed. And right now, there's no place like that. Because in heaven itself, right now where God is, that's where the first sin happened. In the heart of Lucifer, you can trace it back to jealousy. You can trace it back to, you, you know, being covet, covetous. He wanted what God had. He was jealous. He thought he owned it. He thought he was entitled to all this praise and worship and adoration, that he should have a throne above the stars of God in the congregations of the north. So that right now, there is nowhere for us to be where sin hasn't touched it. And so that's why it's all going to pass away. And that's why it's all going to become new. Because when it's new, it's never been touched yet. And that's a great thing. That means that we will dwell where sin never dwelt. Our ground is full of sin. Blood cries unto God for all the murder that's gone on and the wrongful murders, the wrongful deaths. They're all crying out to God. Even Abel's blood still cries out from way back. The blood cries. It's what he told Cain. Thy blood, brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. How much blood has been shed? How much murder, or whatever they want to call it? 
just in abortion alone, over 66 million. And more every day. It just keeps piling and piling. That's a lot of blood crying out to God. We, it's just so, so vile. And that's why, that's, that's another reason. What is the wages of sin? Death. Our earth is dying. It's dying. From all the pollution. But you know what it's mainly dying of? Sin. How much sin is the earth containing? The wages of sin is death, and it affects everything it touches. And sin keeps getting put into the ground. Sin keeps getting put into the ocean. Sin keeps getting put into the air. Sin keeps put, getting put up into space. The ozone, all of it. This is, uh, it, it's like a reaction. Like when somebody's choking, we all know what that happens. If somebody's choking, they, they, they do the international symbol for I'm choking, right? They're having a reaction to what's going on in their body. Same thing with heart attacks and strokes and all these, all, all these things that happen. There are signs that go along with that, that your body is reacting to what's going on, to the crisis within it. Our earth, think about this. We were taken from the earth. 16 elements of the ground are in the human body. And so we were taken from the earth but the earth has been just dumping, they've just been dumping sin into the earth. And now we see the world, the earth is groaning, the earth is in an uproar because it's dying, it's choking, it's, it, 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 there's a blockage. There's some catastrophe happening in the earth, and the earth is trying everything it can to, to, to help itself. And if you don't think so, it says that even the rocks will cry out. If we hold our praise back, even the rocks would cry out and shout. So even rocks have voices. The water has a voice. The air, everything, it all does that. Even, even lightning has a voice. That's in the Bible too. That's what thunder is, is the voice of lightning saying, what would you have me do? It's in the Bible. I believe our earth is dying. It needs Jesus to come and stop us because we have put so much sin into this earth, it's killing it. Because the wages of sin is death. And we know man became a living soul in Genesis 2, 7. I'll skip that. Well, you, you guys know that. Is the soul and spirit of the saved will always be alive with the Lord. The soul and the spirit of the unsaved will always be alive in the lake of fire. They will not always be alive in hell. Hell will give up the dead that are in them. Hell will be emptied one day. It's not a permanent destination. And a lot of people like to get hung up on that. And My whole life, you know, the, the sad thing, is that out of my whole life, I, I almost don't remember hardly anybody ever preaching that there was a lake of fire. It was always, you're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. You're going to be in hell forever. No, you won't. You will not be in hell forever. Because there's something worse than hell that awaits. Something worse than hell 
that awaits, and that is a lake of fire and brimstone where there's constant torture. Constant. And the only way my, my mind can imagine it, and I've often imagined it, maybe some of you have done the same, is lava. Lava is like a lake. It's kind of that liquid that comes out, and then, it, and then it's, when it cools down, it starts making rock. But when that heat, it's all in the heat, it stays in that molten stage because it's, it's coming out of there at insane high temperatures. Insanity. It is literally insane to risk going there forever when you have such an easy way to be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul also tells us to be absent from the body for the saved is to be present with the Lord in 2 Corinthians 5.8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But to be absent from the body for the unsaved is to be present in hell first. Hell is the place that you go to first. Because then it will all empty out when the, when the time comes into the lake of fire. Just like the rich man that died and was buried and in hell lift up his eyes. So we're just going to mention quickly a few things that we find for this verse tonight. We find the surety of death. It's all going to happen one day. Even, even for us who are alive and remain, there'll be a sting of death real quick. Just a little 11, 11 hundredths of a second. I, I can stand that much pain for that long. That'll be okay. I'll be all right with that. We're either gonna we're either gonna go the way of the undertaker, or we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go when Jesus comes. There's a surety, though; it will come. Ecclesiastes twelve seven. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And then First uh, Corinthians fifteen twenty two. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We died in Adam, but we live in Christ. That's awesome. I'm so glad it didn't stop with we died in Adam. There's a change. There's a change that happens there. Because by one man, sin came by one man, sin can be eliminated and righteousness can be given. The man, Jesus Christ, he came. It's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Secondly, there's the sorrow of death. I, I, I don't think we have to belabor that point. We know we've lost enough to know. We've lost enough to know there's sorrow in death. Great sorrow, especially the closer you are to that person. But I want you to notice the difference between the death of two of David's sons. There's the sorrow of those that have no hope. He says that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Psalm 23, 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then there's the sorrow. There's the other sorrow. It says, which have no hope. Hebrews 2.15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We're going to have a deliverance. That's, that's really what it is. It is a redeeming because it's a physical uh, 
It's a physical taking possession of what's been purchased. That's what being redeemed is. So we're as, we're sealed until the day of redemption. So you're, we're basically still waiting on the earth. It's kind of like our, our shelf that we're that we're waiting on for for him to come and get us. But that redeemed is actually happens when we're actually redeemed. That happens when he comes and physically takes possession of us. He's already bought it. He's already bought us. Already paid for us. It's already uh, it, it's already been handled. He just has to come and get us. That's all. That's all that's left. But I want you to see something here too. That there's a sweetness of death. Now I know that that doesn't sound right. A sweetness in death. Oh, but there is. There's. It's sweet to the Lord. It's sweet to him, first of all, because Psalm 116, 15 says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Well, man, that sounds pretty bad. I mean, that just sounds like what kind of what kind of what kind of God is that, that that takes pleasure in his in his saints dying? Because they're not dying. We're not dying. All we're doing is being cut loose from a sinful body and returning to God who gave us what, who we are. That's it. It's a separation. They're not dead. They never were dead. Once you're alive in Jesus, nothing can kill you. You know that? Nothing. And even though, and, and that, like I've, I've explained this, and many of you, if not all of you, have, have been in a funeral where I explain that. How many of you heard me explain it before at, at a funeral? I've explained it many times before that it's just being released from the body, whether by someone's intentional force on you or your body becomes too weak to sustain you. It can no longer hold you inside because it's too weak. It's too run down. It's just broke down. When your body kind of gets like a Ford, you know, then it lets you go. Fix or repair daily, I'm just saying. I don't know. I work, I work around them all the time, so it's amazing. I could keep you here for a while, for another hour telling you about all the defects. Not good. But anyway, listen, we don't die. You'll never taste that kind of thing again. You'll never know death. All you'll have is a separation from your body, and you'll return to the Lord who created you, who formed you. Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. You're going to go back to God. That's it. So there's no reason. And we weep because our bodies are the only way that we can interact with each other. It's the only way you're going to hear me. It's the only way I'm going to hear you. It's the only way we could high five or shake a hand or hug or, or, or call somebody on the phone or shoot somebody a text. If they're no longer in a body, you can't do that with them. So that's the hard part. That's the sorrowful part for us is with the loss of interaction. And that's really what we could mean by saying, I'm sorry for your loss. It is saying, I'm sorry for the loss of your ability to connect with this person. Until you see them again, until that same thing happens to you. One day, our silver cord will be loosed. And we, that's your get out of jail free card, amen. That's, that, that's the get out of jail free card. Right, because this, this body's a prison. It is not a good one either. It's not a great one. So I, I'll be glad to trade this in. Yeah, y'all can bury that one. That's fine. 
Uh, yeah, I got a lot better one coming. I got like 4 million point oh upgrade. Yeah, that, that, that doesn't hurt my feelings at all. Not at all. So that's one reason that we cannot sorrow as those who have no hope. Because we know that if they died in Christ and we're in Christ, God brings them back with him and will meet them and him in the air. That's what's going to happen. So we don't have to fear like that. Job 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 14 and 15. The Bible says, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to do the, uh, to, to the work of thine hands. Listen, we have an appointed time where our change is coming. Our change is on the way. I love that. I love it. For years as a young man after I got saved, I started worrying about being in a place where I couldn't hear the trumpet. I started worrying. I, I actually concerned myself with that because that was that was what was preached. You know, the trumpet's going to blow. You're, we're all going to go up. And I'm like, well, what if I'm in the car and the radio's too loud and I don't hear it? And if you didn't know me in my teens, you I would not probably not have heard the trumpet. <laughs> As loud as I kept my radio. I'm, I'm certain part of my mom's deafness is getting in the car and getting in my truck to go borrow it to go go somewhere. And it was on full crank, you know. Boom! She got a new hairdo. That's just how I did, man. I, everybody in the whole street heard everything that I wanted to play. And, uh, and so... But I would worry about that. I'd be like, Dad, what if, what if I'm this? What if I'm that? And then I, then I started getting ridiculous. You know what happens when your line of thinking gets ridiculous? I'm like, what if I'm in outer space and I'm nowhere near Earth? He's coming to get people on Earth. He said, he'll probably just pick you up on the way there or on the way out. So you don't have to worry about it. You're not going to get missed. It's his whole created world, and he knows where you are at any place in the entire galaxy. There's nowhere you can go, even in the vastness of space, where God couldn't find you to, to pull you out of there. So, and you know, I know you all have done that. You guys have, you've got, you've taken something to a ridiculous level. I, we all do it. That's just part of what we do. But it's also, lastly, sweet to the saint. It's a good thing for us to die is gain. And it's not dying. It's just getting out of the, getting out of jail free card, right? It's, it's, it's time to get out of there. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through 23. This is the last uh, scripture I'll leave with you, and then we'll get into our prayer request time. For to me, uh, for to, me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I walk not. That means I know not. For I am a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Man, that's awesome. And then, of course, he goes on to say, but it's more needful for you that I'm here. So he stayed even though he had a desire to leave. He had a desire to go be with Christ, which was far better. And yes, that is absolutely a thousand percent accurate. It is far better to be with Christ than, than to be down here in all of this garbage. That's you know, and that's just basically how you can sum it up. We're just sitting there, and and just this world is just garbage. 
it's just it's been desolated. It's been, it's just been destroyed over years and years and years. It's sad, really sad. And so, uh, I I think that's one of the reasons that we see so much devastation in the last days over any other time outside of when the flood happened. And the flood was just God's wrath to wipe everybody out because it was just nothing but evil continuously. It repented him that he even made man. But you know what? Man, it says as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of, of, the Son of Man be. It's going to be just like that. It's going to be horrible. And we can see that every day drifting towards that. I wish I could stand up here and tell you it's getting better. It kind of is because the worse it gets, the better it gets because that means Jesus is going to come. Absolutely. He will come. Don't lose hope. He will come. 